guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. Today's episode is all about how many hours does it take to learn medical billing and coding? If you're brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. Okay guys, so I got this comment. I'm gonna read the comment and then we're gonna get into it. So here we go. So the viewer says, would you say it's possible to pass if I studied a couple of months, currently injured, um, and so I will be studying six to eight hours a day, if not more. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. If this is your plan to study uh, medical billing and coding and you think that you're going to be able to learn everything that you need to know in two months, and even if you studied six to eight hours a day, let's just say you studied for 40 hours a week. Standard, eight hours a day, okay, 40, 40 hours a week, you know, for five days, whatever. Um, that only comes out to 320 hours of study. 320 hours of study where you would literally have to learn. And this person didn't tell me what certification they were sitting for, but they did comment on the video talking about the CCS. It's almost insulting to get that kind of comment on that type of credential. The CCS is the gold standard of medical coding credentials. This says that you have mastered inpatient and outpatient coding. Now, if you want to study for 320 hours and then just take a run at it just to see if you can pass it, by all means, go right ahead. But you're better off just throwing your money away because that's exactly what could probably happen. If you look at the pass-fail rates for the CCS exam, it's very low to pass it on the first try. And some people will say, well, you know, I can just keep studying and, you know, if I'll just take my chances to see if I pass. Even if you pass, because some people are just, they just have a natural knack of knowing how to take tests and they just can pass tests. And so uh, maybe you might pass the test, but you're not demonstrating what you should be demonstrating when you take this certification exam, which is competence. And getting out into the real world, they're going to find out really quickly that you do not have the competence because if you've only studied for 320 hours, even if you have a medical background, some people say, well, you know, Blue, I'm a nurse and, you know, um, I know all medical terminology and anatomy and all this good stuff. Yes. Yes. However, I have been a tutor for many nurses who have failed a medical coding certification exam multiple times. And then they finally come to me and they're like, what am I doing wrong? And then we set them up on a better um, study schedule and a better study program. And then all of a sudden they are able to pass. So that's the thing, guys. Sometimes I don't know what people are thinking when they're thinking about studying for these medical coding certification exams. Like there's people that think that, oh, this is something that's a side hustle and so easy to do. Side hustles do not require you to get continuing education units. Side hustles are things that you can make money really quickly and that kind of thing. That's not this. If this is what you're looking at it as, you're in the wrong. And this probably is not for you. And before you comment and say, well, you're being so discouraging. No, I'm giving some of you all a reality check. Because to, to try to get into something like medical billing and coding, and only putting minimal effort into it and expecting maximum returns is a setup for failure. And I'm telling you as somebody who would not tell you because other people may want to sell a program. I'm not here to sell a program. I'm not here to sell you credentials either. I'm here to tell you what this field is and what it's like. And then you can make your own decision. But uh, having time to, you know, not do anything else and, you know, just be at home and maybe because you're, you have an injury and then you're taking all of that time to study, that's going to lay a good foundation. Now, this person did not tell me if they have a medical background or not, but you know, two months minimum is barely learning medical terminology. And for those of you who say, well, I got through that, you know, really quickly, you, your, your medical terminology is probably not that strong, okay? I'm just saying uh, there's a good chance that your medical terminology is not that strong. I'm not saying this stuff to insult you guys. I, what I am saying is this. We have to know what doctors know while never having gone to medical school. We have to know what doctors know while never having gone to medical school. We have to be able to read and interpret their documentation. 
and some of the differences in the medical terms is very slight that it changes exactly where it is in the body coracoid and coronoid are two ones that i could think of off the top of my head two different locations two different locations gastric nemus muscle where is that people will tell me oh that's in the stomach wrong it's in the lower leg so that's the thing that you guys have to know there's many different terms for for the body parts and many different things that you need to know and that's just understanding the body then you, of course you have your medical terminology and pathophysiology and pharma so there's a lot of things and that's just the base part that's not getting into the coding and the coding guidelines and the rules and the modifiers and when do you apply this and what are the rules for that so there's um, guidelines for diagnosis coding there's guidelines for evaluation and management coding there's guidelines for surgical coding and the global period and all of these things and again I don't say these things to overwhelm you you may be overwhelmed by the things that I say but these are the things that you should know uh, I'm not here to sugarcoat this stuff for you now, what I recommend, how many hours do I recommend then? If it's not the 320 hours that this person said that they want to do for, you know, just thinking that they want to study this, I recommend, I always tell you guys to study 20 hours per week. And that is if you're in a program or not in a program, because you can certainly study on your own, okay? Uh, but if you are in a program, you need to be studying 20 hours per week while you're in the school, right? And if you're going nine months at 20 hours per week, that's 36 weeks at 720 hours versus the 300, the measly, and it is measly, 320 hours that that person was trying to say that, oh, they'll do 40 hours a week, eight hours a day. I, and I never recommend studying for seven whole days in a week. <laughs> so if that's, that's what you're thinking, then that's not what I'm doing. I always tell people 20 hours per week, you can fit it in. It's possible to fit it in. Three and a half hours a day for five days and then two and a half hours on the weekend. That will get you to your 20 hours. And it is possible to get that time in, especially with the amount of time that people have for Tiki Talk and all these other things. Oh yeah, you got time to be studying. You have time to be working through your workbooks. You have time to be listening to the guidelines. And I feel like this is just a regular part of my week every week with these videos because people asking questions like this. I am slightly annoyed with this comment only because there's so much to it. And even in that video, I even said how much it goes, how much is into it. I, I believe in this video, I read off the domains. There's heavy domains. The domains is the subjects of the test, right? And these subjects are not light subjects. It's not, oh, fill in the blank and do this and do that. No, this is where you have to apply critical thinking. You have to have um, recall. Even it, it even says it on the candidate hand guide that it tests you on recall, okay? And using critical thinking. So that's the thing. I'm not sure about the critical thinking part, but you do have to use critical thinking when you are going through these tests, okay? So a minimum of 720 hours. If you're going a whole year, that's 48 weeks at 20 hours per week, that's 960 hours. 960 versus a measly 320. Who do you think is going to be more prepared for the medical coding certification exam? Somebody who barely put into any effort into it or the person who put 960 hours or 720 hours? You have to spend the time to learn this. This is not something that you can just learn on, oh, you know, only barely putting any time in. I've had many people, when I ask them, uh, they say, well, Blue, I failed the test several times. I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. How many hours per week are you studying? Well, honestly, every time I hear, well, honestly, I know from personal experience, when I hear, well, honestly, I'm about to hear a tall tale. <laughs> Guys, if you want this, you will spend the time to do it. You will make the time to do it. You won't be so overwhelmed by the amount of information that you have to work with if you're taking the time to study properly. Again, for the 57th, 11th time, you have to get your coding manuals. And I did put out a, um, it was like a little thumbnail that I made. 
and it's for the Optum website. Now, Optum, in my opinion, this is not an ad for them, but in my opinion, Optum has the best medical coding manuals. Yes, you can use the ICD 10 CM expert for physicians from Optum. You can use the um, ICD 10 PCS expert as well, um, the spiral bound version. Now, the reason that I say use those two because they are very, uh, very good and very full of information. The only uh, manual that you do have to have that is very specific is that AMA, the American Medical Association CPT manual, okay? Every association, um, AHIMA or AAPC, they do require that particular CPT book. But if you look at the required books, it'll tell you that you can choose um, whichever uh, publisher you want to for the diagnosis book or if you're taking a test that has a ICD-10 PCS in it, that you would be able to choose a publisher as well. It's just the AMA CPT Professional Edition that we all have to have. And I like that one in particular. So it's a really good book. There's a lot of really good information in it. But guys, you have to take it seriously. If you're looking to get into this, um, it's not like how some of these um, school recruiters are trying to sell the program. Oh, yeah, you know, you could do this in your spare time and you'll be able to learn it. It's really easy. And, you know, if you take the uh, AAPC exams, they're really easy. No, that's not true either. Because, again, I've had to uh, tutor nurses who were taking the CPC exam and they failed after multiple times, finally came to me and were like, well, you know, can you help me? You know, can you help me study? So we... We went through, we made a whole um, study outline for them, and sure enough, they were able to pass. So that's something that you have to understand. These are not easy exams. It requires advanced knowledge of medical terminology and anatomy and pathophysiology. Then you're going through the manuals. There's three that you're going to be using on these exams, okay? With the CCS, and I'm commenting on CCS because that's what this person was commenting on. It's the ICD-10-CM, ICD-10-PCS, and CPT manual. And you have to be able to know how to use all three. And each one of them has a different code setup, right? And they all have their own different rules. PCS, these codes are not already built like the CPT codes. The CPT codes are already built. The only thing that you have to add on to CPT codes is maybe a modifier should it need it. <laughs> and you have to learn about all the modifiers and where and which settings do they apply. Certain modifiers only apply in certain settings. And then um, with, of course, the ICD-10-CM, that's your diagnosis coding, there's a whole front beginning part with all the um, ICD-10-CM coding guidelines that you have to know, not memorize, but no, because obviously you'll be able to take the books in there with you when you're taking the exam, but it's good to know where you need to access, uh, you know, these uh, coding guidelines should you need to while you're in the exam. Because think about this, there's all these chapters that you have to go through and every single one of them has different rules about, um, for example, mother, baby, they have their own rules. Injury coding has its own rules. Uh, um, Oncology coding has its own rules. Everybody has their own rules and their own specialty things. So cardio the same way, <laughs> you know, everybody has their own rules and you have to know these things. And that's part of your, what I always recommend is part of your weekly uh, ritual of working out in these workbooks is listening to the guidelines or reading the coding guidelines because reading the coding guidelines from a book is actually going to make you a faster reader. These exams are, um, with AHIMA, it is roughly two minutes per question. With AAPC, it's two minutes, 40 seconds per question. So there's a little bit more time on the AAPC exam. But, you know, if you're looking at getting that CCS, again, that's the one where you can go anywhere and apply anywhere. You would be able to apply for inpatient positions or outpatient positions, professional fee positions. So you'll be able to do anything with that CCS. And it requires a lot of knowledge. That's why they recommend that you do have experience. And I said recommend, okay? Some people miss that word and they say, well, I thought you couldn't take it because, you know, I don't have experience. Guys, you do not have to have experience to take that exam. It is recommended because of the advancedness 
of that test. Again, it is the mastery. It is a mastery medical coding certification. Okay. So that's something that you have to understand because again, it tests you on ICD-10 CM, ICD-10 PCS, those inpatient procedures and um, the CPT. So it's testing you on everything. And you have to know about present on admission. You have to know about DRGs. You have to know about all these things. Please don't ask me when I have left many resources in the description box for you on where to go to find additional information about these things. I have also recommended to Google um, some of these topics that you may be having a hard time finding books for. You shouldn't have a hard time finding any books about HIPAA. <laughs> uh, HIPAA is everywhere. You can even watch videos on YouTube about HIPAA. So that's something that, you know, these are free resources that are out there. All right. Uh, but if you're going to start studying this, take it seriously. Don't go into it half-heartedly and don't go in, into it full steam ahead and try to cram a bunch of hours of study all day long. Or you say, oh yeah, well I'm going to cram for 10 hours or 12 hours. Why? Your brain is going to stress out and then you're not going to be able to recall this stuff. If you're taking the time tw 20 hours per week and pacing yourself this way the whole time that you're studying, it will be a lot easier for you to recall things. You will be able to remember things a lot better. And your understanding of the material will become easier for you. Okay, It will be easier for you to know what to do and, and, and how uh, to approach different scenarios. So that's very important for you all to understand. These exams are not a joke because think about this, guys. As certified medical coders, when we get into a facility, a doctor's office, you know, a dialysis center, uh, uh, what is it, uh, nursing home, any of these places where they have medical coders, the codes that are being selected and put through to the insurance company are reviewed by the medical coder. Sometimes the provider selects, pre-selects the codes. It is the coder's responsibility to use their knowledge and their skill to go through and verify to make sure that the provider has documented appropriately and that the codes that are selected and, and you know submitted to the insurance, that they are accurate and they, ac they accurately reflect everything that's in that note. If it doesn't, it is that coder's ethical, moral, everything, anything <laughs> responsibility to go through and correct those codes so that the patient is not overcharged or undercharged for the services that the provider provided. Okay. And some providers will say, well, no, I want this code. I want that code. And you're going to give me these codes because this is what I want. If the documentation does not reflect those codes, you will not select them. Why? Because it's in our ethical standards. And even if you are with AAPC or maybe you're not even certified, you still fall under those ethical standards because that's what it says. And anybody who acts in a capacity as a coder will follow those. And this is just an extra insurance policy for this provider to make sure that that provider is not submitting bills that are going to get rejected because of, you know, not supportive documentation and they're going to be able to be okay because you you have their back as their coder to watch what's being submitted. And so then when it goes off and it gets billed, it's billed cleanly. There's not a lot of errors or any errors going on. You know, sometimes things happen and, and maybe like, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe they something wrong something went wrong <laughs> with the claim or something like that sometimes uh when things get submitted they get submitted wrong you know for whatever reason uh either just human error or whatever uh but at the end of the day if the codes are correct then everything's going to be all right because then the person that's looking at it looking at you know the bills that are coming in or the um the payments that are coming in okay this is correct this is correct this is correct and so there's, there's a lot of checks and balances is basically what I'm trying to say. <laughs> a lot of checks and balances that, along the way. And coding is the biggest part of it all. Because again, it is up to us to make sure as coders that we are looking at this documentation, that we stay educated and that we educate our providers so that if they are, um, you know, having poor documentation, that it gets better and that they understand why codes have to change or what what they're documenting this is what we're seeing 
and this is what's being um, submitted to the insurance. This is very important for not just this part, the financial part, but for statistical purposes as well. You know, a lot of times people don't think about these things, but of course they have um, the social determinants of health and that plays a big part in funding for certain programs all over the U.S. And so that's very important. I always talk about my example for um, Colorado. <laughs> they had a lot of spiral fractures and they didn't understand why. Why were they having all these spiral fractures? And it turns out the majority of these spiral fractures were happening because what is the most popular outdoor sport in Colorado? Downhill skiing. <laughs> so it turns out when you go downhill skiing and you you know, hit something going very fast, you know, bones tend to spin. So guess what? They were able to see this data and say, okay, well, we need to come up with some safety campaigns and, you know, helping the people to understand the dangers and how to stay safe. And that is all has to do with the coders as well. So that's something that you have to keep in mind. This is serious. This is not some silly thing that you can do and make a ton of money. You will be able to make good money. It is a good paying field. I don't care what anybody says because it is a good paying field. But the thing is, it takes serious people to be able to do it. Not lazy people, not shortcut people who are going to try to just cut corners and here and there and oh, try to get away with the bare minimal effort of doing anything. And we see this now in social media age, right? Tiki talk. Big one for that. Minimal effort. And all of a sudden, there's millions of views on these people's things. Why? Because these clips are like 10 seconds long, right? And so people's uh, attention span is going lower and lower and lower and lower. Guess what happens when you have a, uh, a minimal attention span? You are going to accept anything that is put in front of you as the truth. Instead of getting all of the information, a beginning, a middle, and an end, and critical thinking. Right. So I'm just saying that because if that's the reason that you are choosing to want to pursue this field, because it's something that you heard on some little quick uh, social media thing. Think again, guys. Think again. This is a commitment. This is something that you have to spend time learning and you have to spend effort to learn. 320 hours will not cut it. It will not cut it. And even if you do pass you'll just be very lucky. But that does not mean that you'll be lucky when you're out there applying for jobs and they give you the, give you those assessment tests and they're wanting to test you and you can't show proficiency because you don't know what you're doing. I'm just saying. With that said, I'm going to wrap this one up. Remember, 720 hours if you're doing it for nine months, 960 hours if you're doing it for 12 months of study. Okay, I'm just saying. With that said, I'm going to wrap this one up. Thank you guys so much for joining me. If this video helped you, please like, subscribe, and share, and I will see you all next time. Bye.